welcome, Philippe, to um, LA, uh, business development VP uh, of a billion dollar corporation. Um, you, you've been very successful over the past 20 years. Um, and I just wanted to bring you on so that you could share your experiences of what it takes to be who you are. <laughs> That's a loaded, <laughs> loaded statement, but I do appreciate it and thank you for having me. Um, how was your flight in? And you're from Philadelphia? Correct. And yes. how was your flight in? I would say that as, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, it's uh, interesting to fly these days because as the airlines and everyone pretends that they are taking the universal precautions and the necessary other precautions for COVID, mm -hmm. it's all a farce because once you get on the plane, there's not an empty seat and um, social, distancing, social distancing does not exist. So you never had zero seats in between your seats? Uh, no, none. Not even one? <laughs> no, not even one. <laughs> not even not even one. Um, yeah, actually, I went to the zoo on the weekend. We had the same problem. Yeah. Uh, it was overcrowding, people everywhere. Yeah, uh, the animals were safer than the humans. It's, it's bizarre. It's really, it's because they, they you know, it's nice you to be able to post something on a wall um, and say that you're going to do it. But, as, you know, as, as I like to say, is that watch what people do and not what they say. Yes. And so um, they had definitely not. Even to the fact of g going through uh, security at the airport, you are in line on top of each other, and you're going up to, to the TSA officer, removing your mask, and they're checking you out, and then you go through, and they probably haven't cleaned the security rollers mm -hmm. and all that stuff in, in decades, and it's, it's disgusting. Is but that why yeah. Is that why you have a bottle of sanitizer with you everywhere you walk? Multiple, <laughs> multiple bottles. That and Lysol. And you are vaccinated? Correct. I am vaccinated. How was that experience? Uh, I would say uh, bittersweet. The first shot was fine. It was great. It was liberating. And then the second shot, I had a fever of 102 for a couple of days. Wow. So it was, uh, it was a little intense. But afterwards, I felt free. Uh, I was able to travel again. So... Was, it was well worth it. And you come out to LA, how often do you come out to LA? Try to come at least once a month, if not more frequently. How do you like it over here versus in Philly? I, it's, it's, so I like to say, love where you live. And I don't love living in Philadelphia anymore. It's, it's, it's grown old. In my old age, I <laughs> would say that I've learned that I like to be in a place in a warmer climate. And uh, my people are desert people. I'm Jewish, so we are from the <laughs> desert. So I do, I do appreciate a warmer climate. And out here, it's 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 always nice. It's always sunny, seventy. Everything's green, uh, and I, I appreciate that. And how long did you, have you, were you born there, or were you I was born and raised in Philadelphia? Yeah. I lived in Paris for uh, a while, about a year, uh, about a year or so. And I lived in Japan for about a year and a half. Wow. Um, so your business development VP of a billion dollar corporation. Um, a lot of heavy weight on your shoulders by doing that. Uh, obviously, you're carrying the weight of the company. Sure. Um, you're big into real estate. Yes. Um, how's the real estate market been for you? So yeah, that's uh, one of my hobbies and my passions is real estate. And if I don't, if I believe that if I didn't, if I wasn't good at my nine to five occupation, I would be a full time in re into real estate development and uh, rentals. So I have probably about 33, 34 different properties that I own and operate, manage, and it's my passion. I love taking something that is broken, that may need some TLC, some love, giving it some uh, beautification and rehab, and then bringing it back to the market and being able to have someone move in and appreciate it. Have you had problems with uh, renters or? Not there's, a single there's, one. There's like six million people in America not paying rent, banks yeah. extending loans or? Forbearance. Sure. Nothing is touching. Not, not nothing. Right. You know, I've been very fortunate. The area that I, I, I focus in is a specific area in Philadelphia, Manionk, Roxborough. It's a good working class neighborhood that attracts young uh, college kids, the demographic. So I have them, uh, they, they pay and their parents co sign. So I'm typically always guaranteed a rent. So um, you are one of the hardest people I've known working. You're day and night on the phone, emails. One o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, I see text messages. It's the gray hair. That's yeah. why. It's, that's, it's a prematurely gray, yes. That's a sign of wisdom, right? Yeah, yeah right. Exactly right. <laughs> Stupidity, but yes. Um, so a lot of pressure on you. How do you, what, what, what's your, what's pushing you? Like what's... The what's, drive? Yeah, what's making you who you are today? Because you're successful and I, I see you and we've known each other for, we've done projects together, uh, working together. How do you define success is the question, right? Yes. That's, that's the ultimate question. So, so two, I guess that's a kind of a two-layered question because what what's the drive and how do you define success so the drive my drive is that 
you could always do better. You could always be doing more. You could always be doing something else and always asking yourself what's next. So I, I measure my life on little milestones and accomplishments of stuff that I've been able to do. And they may be as simple as learning, as becoming a certified scuba diver. Yeah. One day I wanted to become a certified scuba diver, took the classes, did it. I might have been scuba diving twice in my life afterwards. But motorcycle, I've been able to drive a motorcycle. Uh, I had a motorcycle and that's, it's just, it's, so from a business perspective, the drive is, is that I, you know, I had a, I was raised by a single mother uh, who worked very hard for a very long time and was never really there. And I was a latchkey kid, always came home, got in trouble, whatever it was. And you know, that, 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 that story. So yeah. the, the drive is to be better than the way I was brought up and to, to be, ha be able to provide my children a better life. And that's what's that's really what drives so me. So you believe that that was the point that actually was pushing you more? So that like inside you, like as a kid, seeing like obviously a single mother. Yeah. Obviously I'm a single father, but seeing your mother and being were you, were you the only child. Or? I have a uh, younger brother. Younger brother. Yeah, yeah. So being the oldest, you're the man of the house. Yeah. For uh, intents and purposes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. was that a, was that something that was stuck in your mind of maybe unconsciously? Yeah, I su probably subconsciously. Yeah, that and watching my mother, how hard she worked and she kind of installed that work ethic. And at a young age, I, I mean, really, from the time I was probably, let's say 11, 12 years old, I was, I, I started learning, you know, the art of the hustle. Yeah. And so I was, I was out there trying to find what angle I could do to make money. And yeah. so I used to, this is back before Google, <laughs> and so I used to get the newspaper every Sunday, and in the back of the newspaper, you'd be able to buy fish tanks. And as crazy as that sounds, there was a, a, a huge disparity in the price of fish tanks. Wow. You could buy a fish tank, and you could rehab a fish tank, and you could sell it and make a good profit. So what I used to do is I used to buy these fish tanks, I used to sand them, paint them, wow. and then resell them. As a 12, 13-year-old kid making cash, that was one thing, and then, and that were, then it turned into selling pretzels on a corner. Oh. That's a thing that doesn't exist here in LA. What, what were you? What were you trying to buy at that age? I mean, you were nothing. Uh, nothing. It just was, wanted to just, just, just stack the pot. Yeah, it was just the, it was just okay. the the thrill of the hunt. It was being able to the chase. Yeah. chase. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, the chase is, is, and that's really kind of what I was looking to do. And so, um, so it was went from selling fish tanks to selling pretzels to uh, working at a supermarket, bagging groceries. I've I've always worked. That's all I know how to do because that's all I saw my mother ever do was yeah. was work. And, I, and even for myself, I I've actually was in a similar position where I was cutting everyone's grass. My grandmother, my dad would take the lawnmower around three pounds here. I was in England as pounds, so to get three pounds for cutting grass, I'll be doing grass all week, newspaper deliveries, yeah. um, always on the hustle to do something. Right. And I think that got ingrained with me where now it becomes it becomes you. And that's, and I, and that's a, who you are because me and, and you are very similar. Right. You I, sound I, like me. I completely, <laughs> I completely agree. And that's but that's it's it's a blessing and a curse. Yes. And and and. So the, the challenge is, as you get older, is to be able to try to get some balance in life and try to figure out how you can have the, the hustle and also have the quality of life. And yes. that's kind of, I, you know, as we discussed before, is in the U.S. is the work to live versus the live to work yes. concept. And, you know, uh, and here, compared to other countries, I, I personally believe that we have it backwards, is that people live to work, whereas they, you know, instead of working to live. Yes. And so... Um, you know, like look at look at France. They have mandatory mandatory time off. The hour the the work week is less, um, and so it's just it's a quality of life issue. And so, uh, and and you yeah. you've traveled around because obviously in your job you've mm -hmm. been to I mean I mean uh, yeah. I couldn't even sixty seven sixty eight yeah. different countries, and seeing the work ethic or how people are in those countries. I know it's business related, but when you're around, do you see much of how people's lifestyle is over there? So. From it's it's interesting having lived in Europe and having lived in Asia, uh, it's 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 complete dichotomy. So you have Europe, which the the it's a very quality of life oriented, yes. where um, in Asia it's very well in, in Japan in particular is very similar to the U.S. Is they they literally live to work as well. That's why you have the 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 Japanese businessman who sleeps in a suit in a. Uh, in a small hotel that has a capsule for the night because he went out with his friends and drank all night and so that he could be at work the next day. 
Have you been to one of those pods? Yes. Yes, I have. <laughs> How was that experience? It was very interesting <laughs> uh, listening to uh, Japanese men snore next to you. And uh, <laughs> it's, it, we, we, uh, we went there for a night and then we left in the middle of the night because we couldn't, couldn't do it. So, But it was, it was an experience to see. Wow. No, no, that is something. Yeah, you see yeah. on TV and you know, not many people get to experience that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so traveling around, you've been to, what's your favorite country? Where, where, where was the most country you say that you enjoyed or where you love and... You say, wow, that's a cool place. Like, I love this place. I'll go on vacation. I would like to have business there. Sure. Is there a place? Yeah. I, so I would say that the, it, I love the Philippines, uh, but I was in the Philippines in the late 90s, and I was on a small island called Boracay where there was no electricity, and it was magical. Yeah. And so I, I would say I like to keep it that thought in my mind the way it was because I know it's not like that anymore, and it's been commercialized. Yeah. So, but... If I had to go back and if I had to move to another country, it would probably be Thailand. It would be Thailand? Yeah. What do you like about Thailand? Uh, the people. It's, it's the land of smiles. It's, it's literally, it's called the land of smiles because the people are happy, uh, the weather's nice, and you, it's cheap cost of living. So you could, you could survive there and you could, you could do anything that you want there. Um, so, okay, so you've, as a kid, you're hustling, you're doing your stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're trying to make it. How do you get into getting into logistics? Because obviously we're in the logistics business. Sure. How did you turn up in logistics? So uh, my mother started a courier company in 1990. And so small package delivery in Philadelphia, bike messengers. And so I would, from time to time, be a bike messenger during the summers after high school. I would be a walker through town delivering packages. And so that's kind of, uh, that's how I got into logistics. And it was a horrible mistake that I should not, I should not, <laughs> should I, looking back on it, I should have gone to law school, become a doctor, like all other good Jewish boys do. So, but I messed up. So the, that's, and that's, so then I did that. I went to college and I said to myself, uh, in college, I studied Japanese, East Asian studies and business. So I got out of college couldn't really find a good job with that and wasn't sure what to do. So I went back to the family business, worked there for a couple of years, and then said, uh, this is not for me. I don't want to be involved in this. And so then I went to graduate school and got my MBA. And that's where I was able to live in Paris, go back to Japan, and um, and work on pallet jacks. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, and, and then go to, go, go to Japan and, uh, and, and get my master's degree. And then I graduated from graduate school September 9th, 2001, two days before the world ended um, with September 11th. Yes. And so it was absolutely horrible. Um, couldn't find a job for six, seven months living on my mom's couch. And I ended up getting a job as a auditor six months later for an international chemical company that sent me around the world doing audits, financial operational audits, which was great. So I got that experience. And then I worked for a large insurance company doing a similar role. Then I said, corporate America is not for me. And I went back to the family business, which was <laughs> all- you didn't want to go right, to. Right, right, right. And I ended up making a mistake and going back. And you, so- You jinxed yourself from the start by saying that. 100%, 100%. So, so I went back and uh, we grew the business. We opened up multiple offices up and down the East Coast and, and grew the business successfully. And then um, my mother sold the business and I was left without a job at that point. And so I figured uh, that, I, you know, why not? Well, I, I was offered at the time, we were friends with one of the gentlemen who worked at Service by Air, yeah. which was a freight forwarder at the time. And they, he said, would you be interested in taking over the Philadelphia franchise? And so I said, sure. And we did. And I, um, <laughs> and I'm intimidated by your dog. And so, and so, and so. so she's there too intimidated. Right, right, right. Good, good. Um, and so, and so. No, no. <laughs> I'm a dog lover. I also was on the board of Paws um, for a long time, which is a nonprofit for the animals. So, yeah. but I, uh, yeah, so, so I, we grew that. And then, so I took, but I, then I, I purchased the Philadelphia franchise as a service by air. And so that's how I got into freight forwarding. I knew nothing of freight forwarding. I knew nothing of international logistics. I only had background in the courier side of business. So I had a crash course in all of air import, air export, ocean. I, I had no idea what a master bill of lading, what, no, no idea. But uh, the office was lo losing a lot of money. And one yeah. thing I knew how to do was, was to make money and to fix things that were broken. So I was able to fix that office, turn it around, and it went from the worst performing office in the SBA network to number one in the matter of two years. And it was, there's 40, there was 47 offices at that time. 
So that's pretty good. And then we were the largest office until I sold to Radiant in 2014. Wow. And so, and then when we were Radiant, we grew, we doubled in business as well. And we were the, we are the top three office uh, in the Radiant network. And it's been a constant hustle because obviously you're talking because I can hear you jump, you're out of a job, you're jumping, 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 yeah. and you go to the next level. Yeah. So it's been a constant push. And I think you've been fighting nonstop. Yeah. And that's the way I see you when I see you work, because obviously we, we do projects together. Uh, like I see you pushing yourself and you yeah. care for the customers. I see you taking care of the customers. I see you just keep going to the next level and pushing everyone to be better. Yeah. And is there a, a piece of you that's trying to push even the people under you to be better? Is that is that of is that who you're trying to create people out of this? Yeah, I, you know, that's the, the greatest asset we have in any organization, whether whether I own the organization or whether I work in an organization, people report to me or even if they're colleagues and, and <coughs> or mentees, whatever it may be. It's yeah, it's it's growth and I don't have all the answers, but if I if I can help somebody grow and if they want to grow, I will certainly do it. And I think that's that's part of what's what's lost in the world is yes. is caring. It's yes. like and that's you know, what are we put on this earth to do? What is yes. how how it goes back to the second part of the question, success. How do you define success and how do you how how do you measure success? And so is it financial? Is it spiritual? Is it what yes. what, what 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 is it? So um, you know, I, I think a lot of that has to do with caring about other people. And if yes. you care about people and you're happy and you want to make them happy, yeah. it becomes contagious. It's, it's actually when I first began this place, it was um, people we were just picking up from random places. So it was people who were just coming out of restaurants, yeah. people who hang their first job. I think uh, one of our main guys here, his first job <coughs> in logistics. But these people have grown over the last seven years and have become very strong and are a very important part, probably one of our best employees to the organization because of what they've learned and how they've sure. grown with the company from being four people to over 70 or 80 people. And it, it really is rewarding to see what I've done for them. This is something that I, I hope yeah. that they're going to take with them for the rest of their life and say, hey, remember my old boss? And I want to be that guy. You hope. I hope. But, I, I, but, I, but <laughs> I, I would say, I would say, that you know, even if it's one person that you yeah. change their life, that's that's worth it. Because I've been extremely disappointed by people that I thought that I have had a profound impact <laughs> on their life, and realized it went in one ear right out the other. But yeah. if one person says thank you, it's it's worth it's it. Means yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, the logistics industry right now. Yeah. So uh, it's very expensive. <clears throat> everything is becoming expensive. Sure. Logist uh, sh ocean freight is becoming expensive. Pallets are becoming expensive. Uh, Drage from the port is becoming expensive. Being in this industry, what are you, what are you seeing? I so yeah, so I think that you know part of that is um, as a result of, of COVID, yeah. certainly, and the manufacturers not being able to manufacture the wood for the pallets, uh, the shrink wrap, uh, but it's also the, the airlines are operating at 40%. So you don't have the capacity, so supply and demand. So that, and that's really what it comes down to. So everything, everything the price of to do, to live, to work increases. So uh, hopefully with the next few months, we'll start to see a change, but um, I'm not extremely positive because from the ocean pricing forecast for the ocean containers, it's, go it's going to skyrocket. How is the pricing before all this to where the pricing is today? How much of an increase are you seeing? Uh, it's, it's what <coughs> is it tenfold? Uh, no, uh, so so. So if a container was what? Uh, so I think beforehand in going to LA was seventeen to seventeen hundred to two thousand dollars, and what are we paying now? Forty five hundred to, to, to five thousand. And what about to the East Coast? Uh, East Coast, it was thirty five hundred to four thousand, and we're at ten thousand. So it's doubled, so it's more than doubled. doubled. Right. So and gas prices sure. have added to that too. Uh, and you guys pay four four fifty a gallon here. Yeah. We're at two seventy nine to to three dollars. Back, back east. But that 450 a gallon gets us some sun too. So right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Depends right. where you collect. Right. Vitamin D. <laughs> vitamin, the vitamin D tax. Got it. Um, Got it. So do you feel like uh, the pricing of all these high charges, at some point, somebody's got to pay? Yeah. Who do you think? Where, where's your so opinion? It's, I, it's, I have my opinion. It's the consumer. You know, unfortunately, the consumer uh, pays for it. Um, and the, you know, uh, the, uh, the uninformed consumer, because they, they just... They will ultimately realize that this was once a dollar ninety nine, and oh wow, you know what? And I'm now paying two ninety nine for it, and and it's 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 going to it's going to have a trickle down. Um, yeah, no, I see that here too. So I see <clears throat> the pricing of drage being so expensive, the gas prices, everything is skyrocketing. Everyone's putting a fuel surcharge on us. Um, I believe that it's going to go to the consumer as well. Like yeah. I believe that the individual, the small guy, is going to pay for this, which yep. makes their incomes less. I know they're trying to do a minimum wage increase. 
but the small guy will pay more and more, thinking that we've got our yeah, minimum yeah. wage goes up, but that means that somebody's paying for that product now gets put into the, that pricing gets put into the price. My bigger concern <coughs> is the stimulus money and all of this, the unemployment, all this money that the U.S. government is paying. And, uh, and how are we going to rebound from that? And what, what what will be the deficit at the end of all this? Yes. And and how do we get out of it? And that's going to be it's, that's going to be interesting. It's scary. I think the system is broken. And sure. I think we were discussing yeah. that the system is broken, and there's something wrong. There's a lot of money flowing in the market right now. But if there's six million people not paying rent, right? Um, there's forbearances, forbearances. Uh, record number of forbearances. So how are th- how are those those banks? Yes, they're be- they're backed by the U.S. government, but. Uh, there's not an infinite supply of money, so where, how do, where, how do we get out of it? How do we dig ourselves out of it? Because forbearances, I believe, expire um, for the CARES Act at the end of uh, September, October, I believe, yeah. sometime in that time frame. And I think they're trying to extend it for another forty years on top of your mortgage, what, right? Like an extension right. on your mortgage, right? But which is fine, so that uh, you just have to pay pay that longer, so yeah. that money doesn't go away. But for the year right now, for the year and a half, those banks have not been getting any money. Yeah. So. They, do they have the reserves to pay, operate? Have they been, uh, you know, all those years that they've been making record profits, that you hear the Wall Street, this. So how, how are they operating and how, yeah. how, how are they paying their employees? And so it's just, it's, it's the economics of this entire mess that we created and how we're going to spin out of it. So like with businesses closing down during this, this pandemic, we had businesses closing down. A lot of people are not opening up. A lot of stores are sure. not opening up. Even across the street, I've noticed, yeah. Yeah, like it's, it's like everyone's just disappearing. Yeah. I don't know if they can, especially the small mom and pop stores are gone. I mean, we were lucky that we're an essential business and we were able to coast through this. But I've seen billion dollar companies shrinking. Sure. And we handle a lot of billion dollar companies. So I see when they're letting go of people and it's scary when I see that. Um, where, do you, where do you believe this thing ends? Does everything get back to normal? Do we do we fight our way out? Do they print ourselves out as the economy starts picking up? Do you think that we make it? You know, I, yeah. I mean, I think that there may be uh, a devaluation of the U.S. dollar at some point yeah. because because of this. Because once they recognize the true deficit after this, there who knows? I, God forbid that happens, but that's 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 certainly a possibility. But you also have yeah, I, you know, the the small businesses that are just never going to recoup. All, restaurants bars like in philadelphia it's a very small town uh when and everything's really compact and the restaurants and bar there are a lot of bars that have been st- around for decades that are uh, gone that just yeah. just com- completely eviscerated so what are those people doing now what are all their employees doing now and wh- you know because wh- there's no new job growth yeah. really it, yes you have the amazon effect and that's that's so people are <coughs> leaving those industries to go into logistics which is which is inter- interesting too what's your feeling on amazon because amazon for me is taking over the world i mean they're doing everything and anything yeah. and they're getting rid of malls yeah out the wi- I, I believe they're going out the window yeah uh, what's your feeling on amazon so yeah it's 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 they're the 800 pound gorilla in the room and i think that they are and they have the they have the deep pockets to do whatever they want to do which is extremely scary so you know from their own fleet of airplanes to uh you know the buying final yes. mile logistics companies yes. and so uh hopefully at some point we'll be on the benefiting side of that <laughs> and they'll, they'll come knock on our door somewhere but but no but truthfully it's it's um it's scary because they they are a force to be reckoned with, and they will start di- just like Walmart dictates the ocean freight, mm-hmm. o- ocean freight pricing. Yeah. Amazon's going to dictate the price of trucking and and ground logistics at some point because they're going to control so much of it. At, at one point, when we were actually f- putting out resumes, even to get people into uh, our business, we used to have a hundred people as, uh, applying. At some point, Amazon scooped up everybody because everybody hears the name Amazon and says, wow, big company. Sure. But you're seeing on TV right now where they're talking about the unions, trying to create unions, how people are overworked at Amazon. Um, it's, it, I think it's pushing, that ha- alone has pushed up the minimum wage. Yeah. They've scooped up everybody. Sure. And yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's even, I- and they're just buying these huge facilities yes. and they're opening them everywhere. And they have to put people in them, and so and they realize that, and they have the pockets to pay. Yes. So whereas a job might be a twenty dollar hour job, they're paying thirty dollars an hour, yes. which is t- outrageous. But that's what they're doing. Um, so the homeless has been increasing um, over here. Like even with our other facility, we have tents coming up in the parking lot, or well not in our parking, but just around the edge of our parking lot, where our containers park in a secured area. We have people taking a dump along the back. I mean, it's like a river over there. Um, 
it's bad. I'm actually going to hire a port a party just to stick there because oh, we have really? to pay the city to come and clean it up. Oh, it's, really? it's that bad. Oh, that's disgusting. Um, we have people living in trash cans behind. Um, it's, it's, it's getting worse. I used to ride my bike by the riverbed. Yeah. And it's like a village down there. Yeah. It really is that's a village. It's unfortunate. And um, Venice Beach, uh, I'm, you, I'm sure you're familiar with Venice Beach. Sure. Uh, Venice Beach has uh, tents. Uh, and can you pull up that video immediately? This is a there's a guy who's a German in um, Venice, and that's just an idea of wow. how Venice Beach was. And this is a place where I used to take family members, right. and it's right. bad. That's horrible. It's really bad right now. Where even the businesses or the tourists going there, the businesses are closing down. But they found that the the, the some of the homeless are running to the stores taking stuff, so people don't want to be there. It's 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 horrible of where the wow. world where it's where they're coming from. That's scary. So in, in America, there's yeah. there's what three three hundred and forty million people or something like that. That's yeah. something around that number. But then you have um, one over a million ho uh, homeless in the U.S. Over a million, and I think California is almost a quarter of the homeless. It's scary, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's it's you would think that they would be able to do something with all the taxes that we pay. You, you would think that. And I think that you've got a similar problem. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. Hey, Philadelphia, I mean, historically, it's it's a major city with, it's <laughs> we have a lot of poverty. Uh, you know, I was re just reading an article today. So the, so for every, um, so in uh, urban uh, housing, urban development, the HUD, um, the, which is the PH, which is also affiliated with the PHA, Section 8 housing. Yeah. So for every single house that's available for a potential tenant, they have 500 applicants. So there, for every house, there's 500 people. So there's, ju it's just, and those are people that aren't necessarily homeless. They may be living in uh, shelters, halfway, half, halfway houses, or in, in existing um, Section 8 housing, and they just, and they need help. And it's, 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 it's another epidemic. It's really, it's really true, and it's, it's scary. It's scary. And so yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's Kensington Avenue in beautiful Philadelphia, mm -hmm. where, yeah, there's a. <laughs> it's in competition with Venice right now. Right. Well. <laughs> I would probably say it's probably worse because that's really known for the heroin epidemic there. Like oh. they like it's a lot of a lot oh. of drugs and a lot of bad people uh, that that are homeless there. They're not all bad, but that's that you know but you it have it creates the the, the desire. Just like you said, yeah. Venice, they're breaking the stores and they're just yeah. stealing. It. There, it's a lot of a lot of drugs and um, a lot of uh, a lot of bad things that go on there. But yeah, that's the that's right. it. And I you know I don't understand why the. The, the homeless in Philadelphia don't go somewhere warmer. <laughs> like, it's, it's like, I, like I can understand that on the beach, they're camping on a beach. That's a, it's almost romantic. Yeah. The, but here, they're sleeping on in 30 degree weather on, yeah. on, on sewer grate. Well, th they say that some of these cities are giving tickets to um, uh, the homeless, putting them on a bus, sending them to California. Well, not, not Kensington, but sending them to California yeah. to actually live here. I believe so that's what they're doing. That's, I believe that's, everyone turns up in this nice tropical climate, of Southern California. <laughs> I, I believe it, right? So it's and that's it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah, but it is. yeah, that's uh, that's scary. So yeah. um, yes, with the way that you're, so how do you with all this stuff going on in your life? And you, again, you're, you're busier than normally than anybody I know. You, you are one of the <laughs> busiest guys. <laughs> 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 I'm afraid to look at my emails right. at two o'clock in the right. morning because I know yeah. that here it goes expecting right. a response. Right. It's, it's, it's okay. Um, just, just on Saturdays. And how Sundays. do you keep yourself relaxed? How do you stay calm? How do you enjoy life? So what's, that was what's your downtime. That's one of the things I mentioned. It's trying to find that balance. It's a, it's a constant struggle. It's the the hustle and the balance. It's so uh, I've I've been doing martial arts for a long time. So that's the kind of the the op the opposite. That's the the spiritual and the physical release of stress and anger. And that's how I get rid of it. And I've been practicing jujitsu and muay thai for quite a long time. Um, and it's it that's and if I don't. Uh, my wife knows to stay away because I, I, I easily anger and my bad temper. But when you're when you're getting choked out near death on on a weekly basis and uh, and with with friends and go figure, you pay to get kicked your ass kicked by friends, you, you feel you feel better. And so uh, that's 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 the one release. And the other release is my kids yeah. and they you know the patience uh, that you have to have when you have children is uh, is is amazing. Yes. And so I become a much better person becoming a, a parent. And that's and that's just that's the fun part. And actually, there's a specific time when me and you talk in the evenings that you are putting your kids to bed. Yeah. And so I, I know the moments of when that's going <laughs> right. on. Right. So yeah. you're, you're very dedicated to that. Yeah. I, yeah. I give you props. For that. I, 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 that's the most important thing is they, they putting my kids to bed, uh, saying saying good night to them. Uh, that's that's because you know we have a limited time on this yes. on this planet. So yes, and, I agree. And especially as you see that you blink and your kids go from toddlers 
to teenagers yeah. to out of the house. And so I try, I try to be present. So. And how, how old are your kids? Eight and 10. Eight and 10. Are they seeing the business side of you and picking up on ideas that you, you have? Because I, I know with my kids, they see, and I'm talking to them, like, I feel like I'm talking to an adult about business. <laughs> right, right. Uh, should I be talking to somebody else besides my little 12-year-old? <laughs> right, right. It, well, it, it's amazing. And so my son, I, my oldest, I think he's, he has the, the art of hustle more, more than my, more my youngest. But he's, you know, he, read the, uh, he just read the book. Uh, was it from an idea to Google? And, and I think that's what they're called, an idea to Nike. Yeah. And so he reads these books and he gets interested. Uh, and, yeah. <laughs> and so, and so what, it's, it's funny. So last weekend he was acting out a little bit. And so I changed one of the names in my contact list to Sergey Brin. And I said, I'm going to call my friend Sergey and I'm going to, uh, and he's, you know, he's the creator of Google. Yeah. And, I, and, and I, I'm going to tell him because you're on Google, you're on YouTube too much. I'm going to tell him to cut it off. And so you can't do it anymore. And so I changed the name. I showed it to him. I was texting with him. And I showed it. I said, here's Sergey. And, and he's like, you know Sergey Grant? Oh, my God. <laughs> and so, but it was, it was a fun joke. But he, he gets it. And so even last night or two nights ago, he had a meeting with his, uh, a group of eight 10-year-olds to come up with a business idea because uh, they, they want they wanted to do something. So they came up with this, this idea to come up with custom T-shirts that they want to sell. And they want to donate the proceeds to their school um, and to another charity. And I thought that was a novel idea, and I think something that could certainly take off. Who's not going to buy a T-shirt from a group of ten-year-olds to benefit a charity? So, yes. so they get it, and of course he's out on you know on the call touting, oh, and my dad's in logistics and he can deliver everything <laughs> we want and deliver and, and invest. Right, 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 <laughs> deliver, right exactly. <laughs> deliver and invest. Right, and pay for everything. Great. So I have to go buy a, a, a screen printing machine now. So wow. right. that's going to be fun. Great. So yeah. are you going to be the one training them on the machine? Or? I have no idea. I have no idea how to use it. <laughs> I, why not? We'll try. So. Um, do they know what charity they're going to donate to yet? Or those? Not yet. So, we, so um, my, uh, my wife is very involved. So I had my college friend's son had a, a traumatic brain injury called Holton Heroes. He's out, they're actually out here in L.A. And it's, uh, he his was with a nanny, and he uh, it fell off the couch and, wow. and traumatic brain injury, and he's paralyzed, and he's, he's like, I think, six or seven now. And so, so my wife's on the board, and so... We we do um, a lot of charity involved to Holton's Heroes, so that's that's important to us. And I was also on the board of Paws, which is the Phil- Philadelphia Animal Welfare Society. So um, I that's animals. I, I know you're a dog lover. Yeah. Yes. So I have three dogs, but I also I also donate to, uh, to a lot of animal charities as well. So yeah, yeah, so that they haven't decided, but I'll let them decide. There's a group of eight of them. I do not want to get involved <laughs> in that whatsoever. That's not, please. No well, thing. send us the link so that we can actually buy I, some t-shirts. I and appreciate it. I, I shall. I shall. You can even design them. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'll do the logistics for you. <laughs> no problem. For free, mind you. There you go. Yeah. Um, so uh, how long are you in town for? Till Thursday. Till Thursday. Mm-hmm. And are you visiting some sites while you're here or is it? Strictly business. Strictly business, even yeah. though we have the sun. I know you brought the cold weather with you because it's a little chilly today for a the little first time. Yeah, I, you know, I, that's one of the things is that uh, the if I, if I bring my family out here, that's when we do the sightseeing. When it's when I'm here, it's not as much fun to do it yourself. Yeah. So there only there are three places that I'd like to go to in LA that I haven't been to yet, which are um, is it the Pete Millen Museum, which is a collection. I think he's up in Oxnard, a collection mm-hmm. of like a crazy car collection. Interesting. And there's there are two other car uh, museums that are in. LA that I'd like to check out because that's that's fun that's something my wife would never want to do and that I would that's check vintage out. cars a uh, both vintage and current it's like you know the it's not Jay Leno's collection but it's 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 similar I'll, 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 yeah. I'll bring them up and I'll show you um, so with you I know you're in jujitsu mm-hmm. the fighting beating the hell out of someone when you're stressed I, I'm, I'm usually the <laughs> I'll recipient. I'll try to stay quiet. I mean, I, I'm usually the recipient because I'm the old man in the room most of the time. Um, so you're seeing the uh, publicity with these YouTuber boxing. Yeah. Uh, one, thing, one of the main ones right now is Jake Paul versus Ben Akron. Yeah. Uh, did you watch the... Um, the uh, interview. The, yes, the exchange. exchange. It wasn't much of an interview as, a, as, <laughs> as an exchange of profanity and uh, embarrassing. Uh, yes, it was it was pathetic, but yes. It w- I saw he was trying too hard, so Jake Paul was trying very hard to um, piss off uh, He was ben. a bully. He was a bully. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I made you want him to get beaten up. Yeah, I hope he does. Yeah. <laughs> well, and plus, Ben's an a, a MMA practitioner, so, yeah. and a jiu-jitsu practitioner, so... Uh, um, I'll side with him. You think that the boxing side of um, that will be a little difficult for him? 
I, you know, I, I don't I don't know Jake Paul's. I, I watched his fight against Nate Robinson. It was kind of pathetic. I, I, I you know, look, I, I'm not a professional boxer, but I think that he there's something a little bit left to uh, the desire. I think he's solid. I think the guy is solid. Like I think he's got he's got good build. You can see his stamina with how his training yeah. stuff. I, I I think that he if he hits, I think he's a heavy hitter. Well, he's tall and has a big reach too. Yeah. Yes. So. yeah. Um, but I think that uh, with Ben, I think that it's. Um, He's a long, long fighter. Like he's gonna go all the way to the end. I think that if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. At he's gonna, if he does, if Jake Paul doesn't knock him out in the beginning of the first two rounds, I think that Ben Aiken will take him out in number six. Uh, oh, that, are you bet? Are you betting, man? Is that what you're doing? Is that, is, is that what we're getting to <laughs> right now? Know, know, know. Let's let's throw it on the wager. <laughs> I don't know, true. I would say that um, it's a, it's a different type of. And he's Olympic. He's an Olympic guy too. Yeah, I think wrestling or something. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So the. Look what Conor McGregor did against uh, Mayweather. Like that's 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 he lasted. Like it, it, there is something to be said about the MMA world and the the stamina and perseverance that you have at being attacked and and they're trying to kill you. Yes. Boxing is a gentleman's sport. It's a great sport. I love boxing. It's it's a beautiful it's beautiful to watch. Um, it's just not. It's yes, they're trying to hurt you. It's just not the same intensity. I I, I don't think, but. What's my opinion? I on think that? Ben's got such a big chin. I don't think that anyone's going to knock him out. Nah, we'll see. We'll, <laughs> I we'll know you need we'll, one to knock we'll him. See, we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll, we shall see. But. Um, so, plans for the future. What, what are you trying to achieve? Where do you retire? I mean, what, what, yeah. where, where, where are you going? Are you, are you going to the moon? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's. I, I don't ever see myself stop working. That's 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 probably part of my uh, uh, my demise is that I just don't. I. I I can't see myself doing. But you enjoy it, right? Yeah, every every day I get up, I I'm, I I don't I'm never depressed. I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. I enjoy enjoy my taking care of my customers. I was with a customer today, yes. and we had a great conversation. Literally, she had me penciled in for an hour. It was an hour and a half, and we didn't even talk about the business. So we were we were talking about life, yes. and it was it, that's that's when you can bridge personal and, and build a re relationship with a customer, yeah. then it's kind of transforms into a real relationship. So, and, and that to me is more important than talking about business and what the opportunities are. Right. And uh, I don't like to beg for business and that's, that's not my MO. So you don't beg for it. They just throw it at you. No, right, right. <laughs> sometimes too much, sometimes too much, yes. but, but, but the, yeah, it's success. I, I I don't know stopping. I don't foresee it. I'm relatively young, so I still have another and twenty years or so. What do you see? Like you know, you see these salespeople or the people who work under not under you specifically, but you see people in different industries and they can't get it right. Where do you see, is it lack of motivation? Do you think that they're lacking motivation, or there's nothing burning inside them, or they 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 don't know where they're going? I think it's uh, you know it depends on the person, right? Yeah. So it's so it so each everybody's wired differently, and everybody has a different perspective on anything. And some people suffer from the uh, the, the fear of no. Yeah. They don't. They don't. They don't want to be rejected. And that's that's pr in sales. That's probably the biggest thing yeah. is that is nobody wants to hear no. Yeah. And um, and you know no's no's a part of life. It hurts. <laughs> it's, it's, it hurts, but it's a part of life. You know, in in your in your teens and twenties when you're out dating and you go you go you're how many times have you heard no? <laughs> so so but but that but that's life. So it's a ratio thing. Ten no's equals one yes. Well, that's what they say about sales, right? And so, right, it's all about the numbers, yes. the attempts and completions, and so, yeah. And I, I agree, I agree to that. And so, if you're not out there trying, you're not going to close anything. So, that's 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 one thing. I think that people, so fear of no. People are also um, some people feels like they become a victim because if they don't get the business, then they're looked upon by their bosses with a quota, and if they yes. don't hit the quota, then the, you know that then they're targeted, and then that's the whole the victim complex. Yeah. And some people just don't have the the personality and or the experience. And what I've learned is the the most, and I'm doing the opposite right now, yes. but is is to be able to listen. Yes. You know, and so the most important thing is listening. Yeah. And, and stuff. Right. Right. <laughs> you, got, you got me talking the whole time. I'm not listening. So, but no, but the but the truth is, is that you have to listen to somebody, right. and so that's the, and you can't project your needs and desires onto that person. You have to, you have to hear what they need, and then you can customize your response to to what their needs are. So when you see people who want to be you and they say, hey, I want to drive a car like you, I want to wear a <laughs> You tell me that who that person is. I've never, I've never, <laughs> There's a I, list. I, right, right, please. I'd, I'd like to meet that person. But but when, yeah. they're, when they're just saying that they want to be you rather than putting the work in, mm. um, 
what makes them like, what do you say to that person? So look, I say- Bust your behind or so, do so it. It's interesting because last week, uh, one, of the, one of the guys who works for me, he, he was kind of lost and he's very articulate, intelligent kid. He's probably 34 and he, he asked if I would be his mentor. And I said, of course, with pleasure. So I we said, found the one guy right, right now. Well, right, he didn't want to be like me. He, did want to, he wanted advice. He, he wanted <laughs> close, advice. Close, right, I'll but, take that. Right. And so I said, okay, send me an invite for a weekly meeting and we'll carve out a half hour, an hour a week and we can talk. Did he do it? No, he hasn't done it. No, he hasn't done it. Right. So, so that's the follow up. And, and, and as I said in the beginning, watch what people do, not what they say. Yes. So yes. he said he would do it. He didn't do it. And so shame on him. I'm not, and I, I don't need to chase him because you know, my time is very valuable. Yes. And so that's, so that's, that's, that's part of it is, is it's just, it's just the challenges that some people just are not wired for sales. Some people are, uh, just are happy and content with the way things are yes. and good, bad, and different. There's no right. There's no wrong. Yes. If they're happy, God bless them. That's uh, I'm glad that they found happiness because I'm still searching for the, for yes. happiness. <laughs> so, I, I have people who like to talk and hear what they think they're going to do. So I had someone come to my office and he goes, "Hey, I want to start a business doing this and doing this." And I said, "Okay, let's figure out how you do it because I want you to help." If I see somebody doing it and going into entrepreneurship or trying to do a business, sure. I know how tough it is. It's tough. You have I question myself and I said, "How tough am I?" Because it's so freaking hard. And so he comes to my office and he tells me about his business. I said, oh, it's a great, it's a great idea. So how are you going to do it? So let's put a plan together because I love create being a sure. creator. I love that. Yeah. So I said, okay, let's put a plan together. Let's write this out. Let's write this out. Let's do this. What you're going to do? Where the money's going to come from? You can import first over here. You're going to place it over here. This is how you do distribution. And we, we spoke about everything. Social media, you name it. We spoke about everything. Two months later, nothing. And he's done nothing. And he didn't want to talk about anything. And then he starts avoiding me. But I was excited to get his business off the ground and to be a part of sure. creating something. I think sure. it's so fascinating. And I think that there, some people are just lacking that to do. I need to do it. And they don't do it. No, and that's, and that's part. And, it's, and as, again, blessing and a curse, being a serial entrepreneur. Yes. And that's, it's always trying to do something else. And now my kids are watching Shark Tank. And, and, they, <laughs> and like, it's, 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 really, it's really spiked in my house, the <laughs> entrepreneurialism <laughs> in my house. And, but it's, but it, it's good. But yeah. I, I don't want them to lose sight on just being normal. normal life. Yeah, yeah, normal yes. life. Like, like, and that's, and that's again the balance. So, it's, 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 it's really interesting. It's really tough. But um, yeah, I just, it's, I feel like there's, there's opportunity in, in everything you look at, and then, and so it's just being able to identify the opportunity, measure it, and determine if it's worth your time, because yeah. we all have the same 24 hours a day. So it, it, it's, it's. If you, you, you know, don't be mad at me because I spend my 24 hours differently than how yes. you spend your 24 hours. True. And that's also the other thing is, is that people criticize, again, like you said, not necessary criticism as how much I work and what I do. Yes. And I say, okay, that's, that's my 24 hours. I choose what I want to do with my 24. That work to live is you work, but how do you want to live? Right. And that's the, that's the extension of that work to live. So you can work to live and you say, hey, I just want to have my little apartment. I want to do nothing. And I'm very happy. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. If anything, I would love, love that. But when you want to work to live because I want to have good things, I want to take care of my kids. I want to buy, pay for my kids' education. I want to buy my kids the, the latest Nikes because that's what they want in school. Right. I need to buy a printing machine for the sh screen printing machine for shirts. I thought uh, Uncle Amar is going to buy Uncle it. Right, okay. I'm doing the logistics. You can do the, you can do the, the, no the machine equipment. No problem. No problem. No problem. <laughs> um, I, I think it's um, a very um, hard road to navigate. Yeah, it's, it's a very hard road because everyone thinks they want something. But when you get it, you say, man, did I really ask? For right. It? And a, a, after you get it, you're like, wow, was it is, is it, it worth is it? it? Is it worth it? Right. But so. it comes back to the chase. Yeah. Like the chase was fun because you say, oh, I'm going to set my goals out so big and I'm going to keep running after it. Yeah. And that's that's you know, that's that's the just that's that's really the hunt. And, and that's it's really the hunters and gatherers. Right. You're you're a hunter, you're a gatherer. And, yes. and so, yes. And I don't even always eat the meat after I kill it. But I uh, but I, I do I do like to hunt. You like to share the meat. Amongst yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. And so and that, but that's part of it is. And again, going back to an organization is realizing the importance of the assets, the people and making sure that you recognize and reward them. And that's I think I find that's the toughest thing in an organization is that we are so busy all the time running and we're always looking forward and just keep sprinting. 
is that sometimes you don't have to you don't have the time to give an out of boy or out of yeah. girl or whatever it is yeah. and say uh, you know thank you for the great job you've done and yes. and I appreciate you and okay I, it might not be much but here's a hundred bucks for your pocket yes. and and thank you for doing it so that's it's and I've I've suffered from it too. What what, what would you have wanted your kids? If, I know right now they're talking about business. If you were to say hey I want them to do this, what what line of work would you have wanted them to go into? I mean at ten years old and eight <laughs> years old. Uh, that's a good question. What would I, what would I, I'm not into, uh, <laughs> dog oh, training. Do oh, got the, got right, her. Right, right, <laughs> right. Dog training. How about that? Uh, no, uh, the, uh, whatever makes him happy. Truthfully, whatever makes him happy. But I, I could see my, my, my youngest, he, uh, he wants to be an athlete, but I could see him <laughs> being in comedy because he has that, he has that personality. Yeah. And my oldest, uh, he loves to sing and he could be a singer. Uh, we love the arts in my house, and um, but my, he, but he also likes engineering and architecture because he likes to figure out the way things work. And 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 so I, it's possible that's that will be his course. We'll see. And I'll look back on this podcast uh, twenty years from now and say, look, look they came into I business. Call, I called it. I called <laughs> right. They made the, I, I brought them into logistics. I told I was. I told myself I wasn't going to do it. But no, yeah. So. so do you, you hope to one day to come out to California? Is that your I mean, maybe, I, look, I, you know, the, as far as retirement, I, 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 I want to be somewhere warm. I, I, I really would like to live and be somewhere warm. Uh, I'm done with Philadelphia. I love Philadelphia, but I, I've proven that I can work from anywhere at this point. And I think there's a lot of opportunity in the West Coast. And I think that that's, that's potentially it's where, where I'll be or, or Florida. But Florida's horrible in the summer. It's, and you it, were just in Florida, right? Uh, I was in Florida in December. Yeah, you, so dro you took the drive, right? Yeah, we drove down. Yeah. How, long, how long was the drive for 18 you? Eighteen hours. Eighteen hours. Yeah, you drove it in one shot. Or you one shot. Yeah, one shot. Peeing in bags, and uh, they have little Johnny on the spot bags that you can pee in while you drive. And, <laughs> and uh, you weren't wearing the uh, diaper then. No, no, no. <laughs> Luckily, nobody had to make a number two. So, uh, but we were prepared. We had one of those uh, little Home Depot things with your seat on it that if you had to, <laughs> we weren't stopping for anything. So, 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 but that no, was good, and we made it. My uh, my lovely wife and I, we shared the driving duties and. Right, right straight through. How does your wife deal with you being so busy? Because I know that that plays a big part of relationships with business ownership and yeah. uh, wife always seeing you busy and time and where your your time, how does that play a part in your life? I, it's fortunately for our relationship, I've been the same since uh, day one to today. <laughs> so she knows who she married. Uh, and when we dated, it was, it was always the same. Saturday night has always been reserved for date night. And that's kind of, other than that, uh, it's it's business. It's and she knows. So Philippe, I want to thank you for your time. That's it? Uh, yeah, I, I know that you enjoy <laughs> your time over here. I don't want to go home. <laughs> but I want to thank you for your time here. And I, I appreciate you sharing um, your life with us. Thank you for having me. appreciate it. Thank you.
I'm just tripping on this beat. What the fuck about a feet, ayy? By the way, I still do this for the show. <laughs>